I suspect that, that medicine, independent of public health, kills more people than it saves. Hi, my name is Dr. Rich Hilsden, and you're watching Knife Skills. So the question today is, do doctors actually save lives? And of course, the punchline that I'm going to give you is that yes, they do. As a surgeon and a doctor myself, I've been practicing medicine for 15 years. I'm convinced, obviously, that doctors provide a great good in our society. But what's interesting is I've come across like multiple videos and articles over the years. And really more recently, when I made a video, Don't Quit, or my response reaction to Dr. Ali Abdel's video where he talks about how he felt there's only seven or maybe on the upper limit, like 28 lives saved per doctor. When I made those videos, I really, it really sort of got under my skin, this idea that doctors only save seven lives during their entire career, or that the value of medicine is only to add seven years of, of life or something to that effect to society, which for me, I think, um, just doesn't align at all with what I see on a day-to-day basis when I'm actually in the hospital. I see people coming in with illnesses that are terrible, that have very high, if not 100% mortality rates. In my field in general surgery and trauma, there's a few like very specific things. Someone who's been involved in a car crash or been stabbed and is bleeding to death, there really is nothing beyond surgery or the healthcare system that could help that person. That person will die. If you're bleeding to death and you don't stop that bleeding, you die. Another maybe more simple uh, scenario that happens often is a bowel obstruction, for example. You come in, there's a blockage. Sometimes they do spontaneously resolve on their own, but certain types of bowel obstructions, we talk about high-grade bowel obstructions, for example, or closed-loop bowel obstructions, and you can certainly you can certainly see my mini med school lecture to talk a bit more about bowel obstructions if you're if you're interested but those conditions have very high mortality rates when they don't resolve on their own patients die 100 percent of the time and so i see on a day-to-day basis an impact i'm there at the bedside seeing the impact on patients lives and of course that's one of the reasons why i decided to become a surgeon by having my hands in the patient by having that high intervention type of career, I get to see the impact of what I'm doing. The patients either get better or they get worse, and I can see that outcome. Now, obviously, those are anecdotal experiences, and you can't draw massive conclusions from my own personal experience, although I feel really strongly that doctors do make a difference. And that's where I, I saw Jordan Peterson maybe a few years ago on a podcast with Eric Weinstein. And I have a number of things to say about it, but in that uh, podcast, Jordan Peterson basically says that he would guess that if you did the proper statistical analysis, that hospitals actually harm or have no impact on people's health. I suspect if you did the statistics properly, I suspect that that medicine, independent of public health, kills more people than it saves. I suspect if you if you factor in phenomena like the development of superbugs in hospitals, for example, that overall the net consequence of hospitals is negative. Now that's just a guess, and but it's and and it could easily be wrong, but it it also could not be wrong, and that is a good example, or a, that's where my thinking about what we don't know has taken me with regards to the critique of what we do. The fact that it's even plausible is a stunning. Well, you know, medical error is the third leading cause of death, yep. you know, and that doesn't take into account the generation of superbugs, for example. This is something that just totally flies in the face of the experience of people who work in a hospital on a day-to-day basis helping people. Now, it's not to say there aren't problems, not to say that that, that hospital uh, acquired illnesses or iatrogenic illnesses don't occur. They absolutely do. But what's challenging is that when you take a, an all cause look at someone's course in hospital, it is sometimes hard to sort out what the what the what was responsible for their death. And so, Dr. Peterson, in that particular uh, podcast, talking to Eric Weinstein, refers to a paper that, in my mind, has been largely debunked. That says medical errors, in particular, are the third leading cause of death in the United States. 
Again, something I strongly dispute. And there's a number of articles out there that I think do a great job at uh, debunking that. But the first thing I wanted to do is just talk about the idea of how do you actually determine what caused someone to die? This has been a huge issue during the pandemic where people are trying to sort out, well, you know, were they dying from some other comorbid illness and they happened to get SARS-CoV-2? Or was it truly the burden of the disease that's causing it? Well, the same thing happens when you're trying to sort out the difference between medical care causing death and the actual disease itself. So I'll give you two specific examples that I think help illustrate how hard it is sometimes to sort out the cause of someone dying in the hospital. One of the analogies they use in that article is the idea of Clostridium difficile infection or C. diff. Now these types of infections can occur in the hospital, they also can occur in the community. And they're largely related to the administration of antibiotics. So it's an antibiotic associated illness, an antibiotic caused disease. So if you take an elderly person, they're in their 80s, they show up at the hospital with a terrible pneumonia and they get given antibiotics. And let's say those antibiotics cause a Clostridium difficile infection and they die from that. Well, in most data sets, that would be recorded as a medical error or a, in a iatrogenic illness that caused that death. But let's think about the situation. You had an elderly person who had a pneumonia and without a doubt, antibiotics help patients who have pneumonia. So you don't have a choice. You must provide antibiotics to that elderly person or else the pneumonia will progress and the likelihood that they'll die is extremely high. Now, in this particular case, the antibiotics caused an additional harm. They caused that Clostridium difficile infection and the patient died. But was it a medical error? Was it the healthcare system? Was it medicine that caused that person's death? No. The reality was there are always negative potential risks that go along with any medical treatment that's given. And although it didn't achieve its goal, if you were to put a population of people with pneumonia in the hospital and give them antibiotics, they'd be better off than the population that did not get antibiotics. So no mistake was made. The outcome just wasn't what was desired. I'll give a personal analogy as well to sort of relate this. I had a patient not too long ago, terrible bowel obstruction. And the bowel obstruction was from a cancer and I went and operated on the patient. And after surgery, the patient just had difficulty recovering, had a problem breathing, just struggled in general. And unfortunately passed away eventually from the, from the illness. Now, without a doubt, the surgery created a stress on that person's body that made it hard for them to survive. And it would be recorded in such a database as being a medical cause of death. The person developed respiratory distress after surgery and died. But the reality is that the patient 100% would have died without surgery because of the bowel obstruction. That cancer wasn't going to go away on its own. That bowel obstruction would have resulted ultimately in perforation and death. So surgery didn't cause their death. Surgery just failed to prevent their death. Although the cause of death was different than the cause of death would have been had they not had surgery. So you can see how hard it is to sort out when medical errors causing death versus the primary illness. And once you have an article out there that says medical error is a third leading cause of death, it's almost impossible to break that down. It's almost impossible to change the conversation. In fact, that's why I'm here. One of the reasons why I'm on YouTube is to provide a counterbalance to some of the crazy ideas that are out there. You need doctors out here providing a practical, honest view of what's going on in the world medically because so many people, so many patients out there, uh, and so many YouTubers, people who have platforms, have free reign to just communicate whatever they like without having any counterbalance. And so you need both sides of the debate. Doctors need to be on YouTube providing that counterbalance. I'm going to go back into this article one more time where we talk about this whole issue of how many lives are saved. So again, some of those assertions were that a doctor might save seven lives per their lifetime or two or 20 lives, whatever it is, it seems like a small number considering uh, your whole life, your whole career is devoted to helping save people. Well, one of the problems is whenever you start to talk about it's only saving so many lives, you have to understand where that comes from. So one of the issues that goes along with all these things is you start thinking about things in life years saved. 
because there it's very hard to sort of quantify uh, the impact of a saved life when you're looking at it from a population basis. The reason why is, is there's no like, you know, people walking around saying I've had my life saved that you can, that you can measure or identify. So what you look for is you say, well, how much better off would the population be without healthcare? And it becomes a very complicated math problem to sort of, well, how much is it related to hygiene? How much is it related to nutrition? How much is it related to socioeconomic improvements? So how much credit do you give doctors in these studies? And it becomes really hard to sort all those particular issues out. It becomes muddy and complicated and confusing. So whenever you try to put a number, say, well, okay, people are living on average five years longer than they would have if there wasn't a healthcare system, then doctors get credit for so much of that. And then we divide that by how many doctors are in the system. And that's how many doctors uh, have been saved. Well, that's just not a practical way to look at it because here is another personal example. I can remember a case that I had a few years ago where I had a 90 year old. Again, I'm going to use another bowel obstruction case. She had a bowel obstruction. I operated on her and saved her life. She 100% would have died from the bowel obstruction had I not done the surgery. She was 90. A year later, dies from completely unrelated causes. Now, that shouldn't surprise you. If you're 90, and those of us are hopefully are lucky enough to live that long, if you're 90, you know that you're not expecting another 10 years necessarily of life. But does that surgery that I did to give that 90 year old an extra year of life count as a life saved or not? Because if you start to look at the math in these studies, that person would only get one life year left. They, they would get one additional life year in that study if you even did it, did it properly, which of course they, they don't. But that person would get one additional life year. And then you say, well, okay, well, a life on average is 80 years. And so that surgery gave someone one 80th of a life back. Now, you can see the fundamental problem with that is that what that says is it says, well, that 90 year old's life is worth less than the 60 year old life, then it's worth less than the 40 year old life or the, or the child. And although I do think when it comes to how healthcare resources are distributed, age should be factored in. I'm not saying to completely ignore it, but that 90 year old's life saved matters. And all of these studies that try to crush that information down into a, a single number doesn't give credit for that 90 year old's life really as far as how much value it deserves. And because it's extremely complicated because of course, as you're older and have lower life expectancy, you consume more, more healthcare resources. And that becomes more and more difficult for any study to talk about the benefits of healthcare in a society. It just becomes impossible to sort out. And finally, I want to talk about one other issue that's related to this is that healthcare isn't just about saving lives. It's about quality of life and maybe making people's lives better. In, in Canada, this is where I'm from, uh, we have something called medical assistance in dying. It's a federal, federal law and it allows under certain circumstances doctors to aid patients in their death. The consequence of that is, is that people in some cases have terminal illnesses that might live one month longer or six months or even a year, depending on the situation and their quality of life are dying sooner because of medical care intentionally. How do you quantify that? The value of the healthcare system, if you just purely place it on life expectancy, then this is a medical intervention, clearly, that's doing the exact opposite. That's working against that goal. And yet in Canada, in our society, we feel very strongly that this is an important part of our society, that people will have the right and the option to die with dignity. And that's what we give them through this medical assistance dying. Now, I don't provide those services. I'm not involved or really interested in that. But I do see the value, and I see what it means for an individual to be able to make a choice on how they die. So doctors do way more than just lives saved, but I strongly believe that doctors do save lives and make a big difference. In the description below, I'm going to put some links to both the articles that I'm kind of disagreeing with and the articles that I so more or less support or basically what I'm using as evidence for this conversation. So you can read it yourself. I'm more than happy to have people in my audience look at the articles that I don't particularly agree with and I have problems with 
because I think it's important to have that balanced perspective. I don't want anybody to be completely biased by one particular point of view. And I'm out here to add truly another point of view in the YouTube social media lexicon when it comes to healthcare messages. There's so many mis so many people providing misinformation out there, so much misinformation. It's so hard for people to sort things out. And I want to be someone providing constructive information and giving the audience, the people who are out there on YouTube who are interested in watching this and interested in seeing this content expose the truth. I'm more than happy to have uh, those people look at all points of view. And I want to provide my own perspective on these issues. My name is Dr. Richard Hilsden. Thanks for watching.